Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Everyone Has a Story, Mind-Blowing Technologies That Bring Narratives to Life. I'm Trisha Johnson with the Aspen Institute, and we're so happy to have you here. Our moderator, Charles Melcher, is the founder and president of Melcher Media, which is an award-winning app developer, book publisher, and corporate content producing company with over 13 million books in print and 22 bestsellers. In 2012, Charles founded the Future of Storytelling Summit, which is an invitation-only two-day gathering of technology, media, and communications visionaries from around the world. So in thinking about the different topics we wanted to cover in our storytelling track here at the festival, Charlie and his knowledge in the arena of cutting-edge te technologies became immediately apparent. We are so grateful that he agreed to collaborate with us here in putting together this exciting panel of storytellers and curators. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Tricia. So good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I just want to start by saying thank you to the Aspen Ideas Festival for inviting me to help organize this panel. Um, as Tricia said, I am the founder and uh, director of the Future of Storytelling Summit. And the Future of Storytelling Summit is an annual gathering that brings together distinguished leaders from the fields of uh, business, creative, and technology to explore how the digital age is transforming the way we tell stories. Uh, this year's summit happens on October 1st and 2nd in New York City. Uh, and if you're interested in checking it out, our, our website is fost.org. Um, we have here today a unbelievable panel of innovators. This group are, each of them in their own way, contributing to the future of storytelling. And I can't wait to, you, to get you to see their work and for us to all enjoy a, a deep conversation. Um, I thought the way we would do this is I would take a minute and just introduce each of our uh, panelists, ask them to take three minutes and show a little bit of their work, um, and then we'll have a roundtable panel discussion. And then with the remaining, let's say, 10 or 15 minutes, we'll open it up for all of you guys to participate and ask your questions. Sound good? Great. <laughs> OK. So um, I'm delighted to introduce Chris Hammond, Dr. Chris Hammond. He is the CTO of Narrative Science, a company that is devoted to taking big data and using um, computer technology to tell stories from big data. Chris is also a professor at Northwestern University, a professor of both uh, computer science and journalism. Uh, there, he researches human-computer interactions and artificial intelligence, and was the founder of the Northwestern Artificial Intelligence Lab. Before that, he spent 13 years on the faculty at the University of Chicago and helped to set up their AI lab. Chris, we're so delighted to have you here with us. Oh, and one little thing you should know about Chris, he's also a huge improv comedy <laughs> person and a stand-up guy. So thank you. Welcome, Chris. Uh, uh, thanks, Charlie. Um, uh, so uh, we have a, a short video that, oddly enough, comes from uh, Future of Storytelling, uh, which will give you uh, a tiny taste of, uh, of what, uh, of what uh, narrative science does uh, and what my overall philosophy is. And then so we'll see this video, and then I'll, I'll talk briefly. We've entered a world that we call the world of big data. Everything, every single action, every sales moment, all the stats associated with the game, the box score, the line score, the play-by-play, -play. if it's in news, if it's in sports or finance or real estate, to be able to take masses of data and bring it down to the point where we can give you exactly the story that you want and often the story you need. And so you don't have to know the numbers. In fact, you don't have to know the numbers at all. You don't have to see the numbers at all. All you have to do is listen to the story. That's what narrative science does. I'm Chris Hammond. Uh, I'm uh, the, one of the co-founders and CTO of Narrative Science. Narrative Science is a technology company, and our technology transforms data into stories and insight. We take a language that people are not used to. That is the language of highly structured data, spreadsheets and numbers, uh, and we turn it into narratives, into stories uh, that are really the natural way in which uh, people communicate with each other. A lot of the power of this technology is this notion of an audience of one. And so the starting point for us as a company was we actually wrote uh, college baseball stories uh, for, uh, for the Big Ten Network. There's a, a company called Game Changer and they have an iPhone app that allows uh, parents and coaches 
to score uh, Little League games. And so what they did is they handed, started handing us the data. And the computer would write game stories. Last year we wrote about uh, 370,000 of them. Uh, this year we're going to write probably around 2 million of them. The game story for a single Little League game is really interesting only to a very small group of people. Uh, the kids on the team, the parents, uh, maybe the, 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 the kids' friends. But for those people, they're tremendously important because you get to see, these kids get to see the story of their efforts, of their lives, of what they've done, written up in a way that looks absolutely like a human being wrote it. The Red Sox beat the Rays 5-1 to one Wednesday behind both the bat and the arm of Zach Smith. Smith racked up four RBIs on two hits for the Red Sox. He singled in the first inning and doubled in the seventh. Smith, Smith got, got the win. the win for the Red Sox. Thanks to eight strikeouts, Smith allowed no earned runs on five hits in one walk. Taking that and turning it into real evidence to actually provide advice that can help you make decisions. It's not general, it's not abstract, it's specific, grounded, and relevant. That's for you, and that's a good story. Uh, I mean, thank you. And to, to clarify, we have a, a technology. It's an artificial intelligence technology called Quill. And we can take any kind of structured data any set of numbers that actually is associated with the world. And the system will mine those numbers for meaning, for insight, for advice, and transform that meaning, insight, and advice into pure natural language. That is, English that you can read. And it's not a story about the data. It's a story about the world through the lens of the data. And that story can be about your business, your organization, your baseball game. Um, and we can actually tell stories about you um, if you share the data with us. Uh, the power is that no one in the world ever wanted all the data that we have. In fact, no one wanted data. They wanted to know what was going on in the world. And we're now the transformational tool that allows people to see the world on the basis of all of this data that's been collected about it. So that's what we do. Thank you, Chris. That's <laughs> great. OK, so now I'd like to introduce Candace Factor. Candace is the general manager at Wattpad. Wattpad is a social platform to bring people together through reading and writing of stories. In fact, it's the largest social uh, gathering for readers and writers in the world. There are over 27 million active users on Wattpad. There are something like 45 million stories that you can read on the platform. And the engagement is, what, 6 billion minutes spent each month on Wattpad. It's astounding. <laughs> Um, before joining Wattpad, Candice was a uh, serial entrepreneur. She helped to start a number of companies and build companies in the tech space in Canada. And um, before that, a strategic consultant. Um, so, Candice. Great. The, the video? Yeah, let's, let's go the to the video. video. Yeah, I'm the video guy. <laughs> <laughs> I have videos for everybody in the audience as well. <laughs> Are you using Hi guys, my name is Jordan, um, also known as XX, created a girl 16 XX. Uh, I made that username when I was in seventh grade and it was kind of embarrassing, so you can call me Jordan. Jordan is one of our writers. She has over a hundred million reads of her work. People say teens don't read. They aren't interested in like fiction and narrative and storytelling, and I have uh, some evidence to suggest completely otherwise. What are they doing? Uh, well, actually, they're reading on their cell phones. Most, you know, social mobile platform engagement is incredibly short. On Wattpad, teens spend three and a half hours a month being immersed not in video or in chat, but in, you know long-form narrative fiction. What happens is a writer will put their first chapter on and then if I'm a reader of that chapter, I follow that writer. And every time they publish their next chapter, I get a notification on my cell phone saying, hey, Emily Lint has just published another chapter. Just like TV hooks you for each week you keep coming back, that's how storytelling works on Wattpad. The reason teens are using this is because it is a social platform. Teens are writing for teens. It's not 
uh, a publisher saying, this is what young adults should be. This is what you should read uh, as a teenager. Teens feel like they have voice, they have freedom, they have control, and they have a really positive community. And out of this, we've got these teen phenomena, you know, stars. So every week I have a different teenager who's being picked up by a big publisher because their story had resonance first. A 17-year-old high schooler is already shaping up to be the next big thing in literature. Just couldn't find anything that appealed to me, so I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna write my own book. Mobile changes this ability for people to access the written word and give voice to their personal stories in a way that's as revolutionary as the printing press. There's seven billion people, but there's actually five billion phones in this world today. A guy who emailed us and he literally came from a village in Africa and said, we don't have running water, we don't have a library, we don't have internet, but thanks to Wattpad, I'm teaching people to read and write. We have close to 17 million users. My name is Taylor, or Kitty Pride 072707 on Wattpad. I just wanna thank all my amazing fans for being so supportive when I was writing my books. But what's fascinating is, is just the growth that we're seeing in the above 18. All these social platforms start with young people, right? So you look at Facebook, it was all about teens. But the thing about teens is they know what's coming next, and so we're really seeing that too. <laughs> thanks. Great. Well, thanks, Charles, for hosting me at uh, the Future of Storytelling last year. And just really quickly, the only thing I would add is we've grown tremendously since last uh, October. And as Charles mentioned, our user base is now actually 27 million people. And we're really grown in the older demographics, too. So this is really much more universal than just <laughs> teens. It's people finding personal connections through stories. And really, uh, the one piece I think that also isn't mentioned in there is just everything is mobile. 85% of our usage is mobile, so people are taking stories with them, they're following along serially, and it's all about the social interaction. Uh, and basically, if you love any kind of story, you likely can find it on Wattpad today. Our number is actually 54 million today wow. of story parts uploaded. So, great to be here. Great. So Jonathan Harris. Jonathan is a digital artist, a computer scientist, and a documentarian who's able to seamlessly bring together programming, stats, and the visual arts to tell powerful human stories. As an artist, his work such as We Feel Fine and Universe have received accolades around the world for their ability to take big data and make it comprehensible, beautiful, and evocative of human emotion. His role of creating uh, Cowbird, which is an online storytelling community, has made him able to bring together, to stimulate, to collect, and to preserve tens of thousands of stories with the intention of creating a public library of human experience. Jonathan's work's been broadly displayed and exhibited in uh, prestigious institutions around the world, such as the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the New York Museum of Modern Art, and the George Pompidou Center in Paris. Jonathan is a digital artist. He is the Picasso, I like to say, of the digital age, whose canvas is code. Please welcome Jonathan Harris. Wearing uh, vertical instead of horizontal stripes. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that was very nice. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to quickly give you a taste of uh, three different projects that I've made over the years, which kind of show different phases I've gone through. I, my background was actually um, like very traditional. I started out as a painter and a diarist, and then I ended up studying computer science and uh, had this whole new tool set at my disposal and thought it would be interesting to use code as an art-making medium. Um, code and data working together. Uh, one of the first projects I made in that realm was this project called We Feel Fine, which is a few years old. It's a search engine for feelings. And every few minutes it scans all of the newly posted self-expression on the web, searching for the phrases I feel and I am feeling. And when it finds one of those phrases, it grabs the sentence, uh, some of which are visualized here. The brighter ones are happier sentences. Uh, the darker ones are more negative sentences. I choose to do something without coercion that I feel better about 
to do it better and it generally get it done faster. That's weird. I succeeded <laughs> in a... That's <laughs> uh, too long. Uh, I've been with friends and I love just being with my friends, but I feel like it's either bored alone or bored together. Totally. Um, and so this, this uh, movement here is called madness. It's this swarming mass of particles. You see they start to show some human properties like curiosity. Some of them are clustering around the mouse. And when I move away, they lose their interest and they go back to their wandering. If I click the background and hold down the mouse, they show fear and they run away from me. Um, so this is a principle I use a lot in my project to try to embody the thing that you're um, displaying with traits that match the thing that's being displayed. So in this case, these dots represent abstractions of human beings. Uh, there's a variety of different movements in this piece. This next one shows the sentences one by one coming down from the ceiling. Um, I feel like an alien with a finger standing out whenever I do anything. I feel this could easily lead into harsh situations. I feel that Nicholson played the Joker better. Um, uh, some, of the some of the blog posts also contain uh, photographs, and then they get paired together into these montage compositions. Like, I feel like when you're waiting, you become trapped in a moment of nothingness. Uh, but then what gets interesting is there's this whole statistical side to this mode of storytelling. Uh, this is showing uh, better, good, and bad, uh, very common feelings right now. Uh, this is a gender breakdown showing women being a little bit more emotive, a typical phenomenon. Uh, an age breakdown, uh, weather breakdown, showing the feelings taking on the physical traits of the weather they represent, a world map showing where the feelings come from, uh, feelings that are appearing more than usual at this moment, so the world is feeling bored at 4.6 times the usual level, uh, blessed at 2.0 times the usual level, and then there's these mounds which show the most common feelings overall. Uh, there's also a really powerful search interface, so you can look for a certain population, you like women feeling um, manly or uh, uh, maybe masochistic in their 30s in the rain in a certain country going back to 2005. So, Send me the number. For me. <laughs> so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of data. There's around 50 million feelings that have been collected and the feelings are just sentences. So this was sort of this phase I went through of like big data um, storytelling where you're trying to look for the stories that are hiding in data. Uh, in my mid-20s, I started to become curious about my own experience, and I started designing projects where instead of writing a computer program to gather data, I would set up rules for myself to follow, and I would gather the data myself behaving like a computer. Um, in this one, this is called the whale hunt. Uh, I gave myself the rule that every five minutes I would take a photograph, and more frequently when my heartbeat got fast during 10 days of an Alaskan Eskimo whale hunt up in Barrow. These are all the photographs here arranged chronologically. Uh, this is a timeline showing the exciting moments. And then you can actually zo zoom into this story at any position. You see me sleeping on the airplane going up there. This is a, like a medical heartbeat graph showing the exciting moments reading Moby Dick. Uh, this is out on the ice at whaling camp. Um, and then if you go down towards the end here, you'll, you'll see the process of cutting up two of the whales, which is very gory. Um, this was also a chance to experiment with a new storytelling interface. So uh, there's a way where you can pull out arbitrary substories from within the larger narrative. So you can pick that one whale plus blood and tools and uh, the Arctic Ocean and a heartbeat level of uh, fast, and you can enter the story that matches those constraints, and it'll show you the, the narrative to match. So this was kind of a prototype for a broader storytelling approach where you can take a mass of data and pull out arbitrary path through that data. Uh, another project in a similar line, uh, a little bit more racy, so I apologize, is a project documenting the everyday lives of uh, sex workers in New York City. Uh, similar to The Whale Hunt, I spent 10 days hanging out with 10 different women while they were producing a lesbian porn series in New York City. And I took a 10 second video clip every five minutes for 10 days, performing these abstract glimpses of their everyday lives. Uh, it was about six and a half hours of footage, which is represented here. This is showing every single frame of video from, uh, from those six and a half hours. And you can click on anything that sounds interesting and zoom in there, and you can start watching the video from that position. Um, this is a girl on set. The internet might be a bit too slow. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> it's, it can Maybe get a little not the racy. right position. <laughs> yeah, uh, just let you look at that on your own terms. But um, some, some women woke up earlier than others. Some went to sleep later than others. Uh, all the trade-offs from one to the other happened at 10, 10 in the morning every day. The project was all 10s, 10 women, 10 days, 10 second video clips. The project's limited to 10 viewers per day who have to purchase $10 <laughs> tickets to see it, and you have to schedule that ahead of time. Um, so it was sort of playing around with the instant gratification of internet porn and introducing artificial scarcity and delayed gratification and things like that. Um, and also serves as a sort of like verite look at the lives of sex workers. So that's all. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic to Yoni. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Yoni Block started his career as a musician 
and with two gold albums, found himself as a bona fide rock star in his uh, native country of Israel. And uh, from his experience of creating his own music videos, he struck upon this idea that the viewer should be able to navigate their own way through the story of the music video. And so he and his bandmates wrote some software to let that be possible. And they've turned that into a company called Interlude. And Interlude now has patented technology that enables musicians and filmmakers and marketers to tell seamless interactive videos uh, and to make seamless interactive videos and commercials. Um, some of his clients now include some of the sponsors of this fine event, like PepsiCo and Shell, uh, Lincoln Motor Company and ESPN and many others. Um, they have, uh, I should tell you, their most successful project to date is this one music video they did with Bob Dylan based on one of his songs, uh, Like a Rolling Stone, which has been viewed 70 million times, although I don't think viewed is the right word, I think kind of manipulated or played with is the right word. Um, Interlude recently raised $20 million in capital from some of the finest investors such as Sequoia Capital, uh, Eric Schmidt's investment group, and Intel Capital. Um, and Yanni is really on his way to becoming a rock star of the tech community by literally reinventing a new medium or inventing a new medium of interactive storytelling. Go so, on, go on. <laughs> please welcome Yanni Block. Thank you. So, so I'm, uh, my name is Yoni, I'm from Israel, the south of Israel, a city called Be'er Sheva, that I'm still trying to find the equivalent in the US, but the closest I found is Alabama. So it's like the Alabama. <laughs> um, and I, I uh, grew up you know, studying classical piano, because my mom is a painter, she bought me a piano, and my dad is a physicist, he bought me a Commodore 64. So I was, a very geeky kid, I like playing games and playing classical piano, so, you know, no girlfriend for a very long time. <laughs> but um, instead of that, I, I uh, recorded songs at home, I used like uh, audio recording uh, software in the middle of the 90s, and I uploaded them to a website in Israel, before there was, it was, two, it was 1998, before MySpace and all those things, and um, it let me uh, upload my, like it let you upload anything, and I uploaded my, my songs there, and the daughter of the only record company in Israel, which is Sony CBS, played it to her father and said, you should sign Yoni, he's very popular on the internet. And he said, what is the internet? <laughs> but they gave me a three record deal and I have two gold record albums, which is only 20,000 copies. <laughs> <laughs> I was also a judge on the Israeli version of American Idol. And the only reason I'm telling you all that is that, uh, just so you know, if you were like a group of 14-year-old Israeli girls, you would be pretty excited now. <laughs> Sadly, it seems you're not, so I will work with what I have. Um, our basic idea was we wanted to create, and it's, it's a company called Interlude that we started three years ago, me and my band, because we wanted to make an interactive music video. And the idea was very simple, that instead of creating this linear timeline curated ride, we will let people play, like create a whole playground and let people explore it. And the first video, and I, I'm going to show you two short videos, and the first one I'll show, um, I like to show it because I'm, I'm in it. <laughs> and um, this was uh, a shot in uh, Tel Aviv. Anyone here ever been in Tel Aviv? Oh, wow. So it's a little like Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is like downtown Tel Aviv where the musicians live. You can see it's not very... <laughs> so you can see I'm very hip <laughs> and it starts like a regular video and I'm walking this party but as we approach the second verse there's two people coming to the party this guy and this girl and let's say I click on the girl I give her the headphones and now we follow her and she also joins the singing now he's going to a different room and different things happen to him, but to see them you have to play it again. That initially that's what I wanted as a musician, people to play it over and over again and have the song stuck in their head. So now you can see she's um, flirting with this guy while he's kissing his girlfriend. Very common in Tel Aviv parties. 
And we can choose to go with the cheating guy or the sweetie pie. Let's keep on going with the girls. Wish I could pretend to be happy. So you can see it goes seamlessly when you make the choice, even though it changes the stream in real time. And even though we shot it in one night, there's 256 different combinations you can make out of the video. All the people you see here, you can get to them if you choose differently. Here you've got her two friends, Christmas and Hanukkah. We'll go Hanukkah because in the script we wanted to show that Hanukkah can go wild. That's the wildest she would go. After all, a Hanukkah. Um, if you don't make a choice, it makes a choice for you, either randomly, the most uh, 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 popular choice or not choosing can be a choice. But now it's a musical choice and you can choose if the next chorus will be acoustic or electric. What do you like? Okay, acoustic it is. So they pick up acoustic instruments and play it acoustically. So you also change the music, not just the video. And this is, by the way, my lead developer and my CTO. And uh, it doesn't have to be two choices. So here you can choose who from the band will play the solo. Who do you like? Weirdo. Weirdo. Yeah. Weirdo is also the guy that got all the girls. Now each one has a completely different dance and a completely different solo playing. And what's cool about it that we didn't think about, because you make all the choices in real time, you're actually making your version of the video. So when we released it in Israel, people shared their version in the end on Facebook and said, did you hear the new Yoni Blow song? And then other people said, yeah, but you didn't hear it the way I did and put their version. So even though, no matter what they chose, it was my song and I was fine about it, they felt like they were part of the creation. As you can see in the end, it always goes back to me, there's no choice. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to put a limit. Uh, but this was, this was really successful in Israel and then we moved here to the US and, and uh, started to doing other things. And just because I really want to do this quickly, to show you something, like an uncommercial something we did, just to show how seamless everything is, and I'm going to do it for you, Charles. It's we wanted to make an interactive song that like the lyrics change seamlessly on the fly. So it's a video that starts and you choose it's gonna be a love song or breakup song. I'll choose a love song to start on the right foot hill. There is love around and he starts singing about love, but I can choose what should he sing about. You your eyes, your hair, or your body. Charles, look at me. Your eyes, definitely. Now he's starting about your eyes, you which are blue, right? Eyes, the world, it and he will sing. Like oceans, the deep blue so the lyrics change on the fly, and then you can even write a name. If he has the name, he pulls it out of the database and sings it to you, and if he doesn't, uh, he just sings baby. Anyway, <laughs> this is for me to you. I love you, Charles. And just to finish it off, because it's really cool, you can choose the next thing. You'll see in a second. What do you prefer, French or Italian? So it takes random segments of videos and puts them together to create a random poem in French just for you. Love you. J'aurais voulu te dire avant que tu partes ce matin. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's a tough act to follow. Um, but I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to take... Oops, sorry. I'm going to take just a second and show one thing that I had the honor to work on. And yes, now I'm in. Um, so this is a project that uh, Meltra Media made uh, a few years ago working with Vice President Al Gore. Uh, we had the honor of producing his book, An Inconvenient Truth, and then we worked on the sequel to that called Our Choice. And I'm going to just very quickly show you a little bit of this app. Um, so basically, you can move through the pages or the chapters by swiping through the chapter opener, or you can move through any of the pages below. When you get to something that you want to open up, you can just tap on it and it opens. Anything on a page can be picked up, moved around. 
If you drop it, it goes back into place. If you pinch it open, it plays. Um, so in this case- I was looking around for a spot to put a wind farm. And so I found this spot that- will swipe off that. Um, tons of photographs, tons of maps, all sorts of rich media in here. But the real opportunity and the reason I'm sharing this with you is because when I saw the, the iPad, what I thought about was how I could have a physical, um, a physical interaction with the experience. And so we built a number of interactive infographics that you could physically interact with. So um, this one is an infographic that represents the idea of intermittency. So as you see, there's no wind, so the uh, windmill is not generating any power and the lights are off in the house. But if I generate some wind, I power up the battery and turn on the lights in the house. Of course, as the wind dies down, so does the energy generation and the battery draws down and the lights will go out. Um, this is one example. I'll show you one other fun example. And of course, you can do this manually as well. I'll show you one other example from here of this uh, get to soil. And this is just a simple bar chart. Um, the idea in this bar chart is that it shows how much carbon is stored in the ground, carbon sequestration. Um, it's organized according to biomes. So you see tundra at the top and then tropical forest. But if I put my finger next to that bar, it'll show you a picture of the tundra, or as I come down, the tropical forest, or the wetlands. And in the map in the lower corner, you see where in the world those biomes exist. So we thought that was pretty fun, right, to be able to physically interact with it, but um, we also thought it might be nice to be able to reorganize the information. And then the real thing that we, that we wanted to play with was um, how could I let somebody um, interact with the data in real time? And so we have this map in the lower corner, and if I put my finger on the map and I start to fill it in, let's say I'm asking that question, how much CO2 is stored in North America? So as I fill in North America, in real time, you see the, the data appear on the bar chart. Or let's go to South America now. Or let's just do the whole world <laughs> as I draw around it. Um, so this was, to me, this was really profound because it was letting me interact in a whole new way with the information. Um, this app ended up becoming the, uh, let's see, it, it was instantly a bestseller on the App Store, top grossing app for several weeks. And um, at the end of the year, Apple awarded it the award for best designed app of the year. Um, it was a great transition for my company from having done books for so many years to now doing interesting interactive media. Uh, but what was really uh, important to me was that we received a lot of accolades in the press. You know, David Pogue wrote it up as having reinvented the book in the digital age. And, um, but the most profound comment that I received was a parent who wrote in and said, I've just become jealous of how my children are going to grow up learning. And that one really stuck with me. I mean, I'd been making books for 20 years, and no one had ever written anything like that. Um, and we made one piece of, of new media uh, technology, and we post published it, and all of a sudden, we felt like we were contributing some way to the future. So I show that as a good transition for a conversation for all of us as a group, which is, how is storytelling fundamentally changing? Um, and maybe we should just start with the, with the oldest form, which is, which is publishing, you know, words. Um, a lot of people say the book is dead. Uh, I suspect that we have a lot of love, um, book readers and lovers of books in this audience. Uh, in fact, do we have some avid readers here by hand? <laughs> yes, I thought so. And, and when you read books, do you prefer to read them um, on paper or digital? Let's say paper first, if I show of hands. <laughs> and digital? Paper has it by a good number. Just okay. one quick question. Well, who doesn't read books? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I think that's like, also if you don't read books, you won't no, raise your hand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, which is cool, by the way, because it used to be not cool to read books. Now it's very cool to read books. <laughs> yeah. I think listening counts, yeah. yes. Um, so, so let me put that question to you, Candice. Do you think uh, books are dead? Tough question. Uh, I don't think they're dead. I just think they're gonna be used in different ways. So before you had this very powerful thing called the internet or your phone, you have to use a book. There wasn't an option but to use a book. 
And now that we have mobile devices and the internet, it's very, very powerful how, how it changes the reading experience. And so I think most people have their phones with them and it's just a lot easier to read with your phone on you while you're on the go or having it close by. But I think there's a place for physical books too. I think the idea of a physical artifact that people can touch, hold, feel is still very powerful. I just don't think it will be the main means of consumption for reading or for telling stories. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like every time there's a new medium or a new language, there are certain things that are suddenly possible to stay that were not possible to say before. And usually when new languages first appear, the first thing they do is they imitate the communication of the previous totally. language that they're replacing. So the first stuff that people use the internet for was reading words. And so you have web pages, you have long things you scroll through, you even have um, reading experiences mm -hmm. like Wattpad. But in some ways, these are all reimagining what, what books already do. The same thing happened with TV. Like a lot of the early TV was listening to people playing music because that's what people used radio for before. Um, but with time, TV becomes a medium all of its own, doing things that radio can never do. And the same thing eventually will happen with the internet and with code. It will start to do things that books can't do at all. And so it won't even be this question of, are books dead? Well, books will still exist, but so will all of this new stuff that never existed before. And maybe the, those new things will feel more resonant with the times that we're living in. Yeah, um, I think now it's, a com like it's, it's about comfortableness. Like uh, when my grandma is 90, very active, she has a Kindle. She just likes the fact that she can take a hundred books with her instead of, and not, you know, carry everything else. So it, it didn't really change it. There's like books now contain more like a nostalgic thing. Like, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> but like, I mean, even if not now, so in five years, and I'm talking like my dad is one of the greatest book lovers I told you before, but it's like vinyl, you know, that even though lossless, you know, files so, or very high quality MP3s can like be even higher quality. The vinyl has in the background that makes you love the music more, but it's more about that it's cool and warm and retro and, and things like that. What I do agree with this is that currently it's all reimagination of things that we already had. Right. So more, it's more about like the fact that because it's a smaller screen, you have a shorter attention span, you read in more sh shorter form stuff things like that, so the, the format of how you read changes, but not the essence. Well, so how about the act of writing? How about this, this issue of authorship? How is that evolving now in the digital age? I mean, we see all of these tools, Wattpad being a great example, that's sort of democratizing the ability to tell stories. Everybody can tell their own story now. Um, so do you think that the stories are fundamentally different when everyone can do them? Um, are... I think, again, like writing is a, I mean, language is basically just a system of symbols that are used to point at some truth, which is not the symbols themselves. The symbols are symbols. Um, and if you look at language in that way, writing text is just one form of symbolic creation. You could also look at an Instagram photo as a type of language, or a Vine video as a type of language, or a conversation as a type of language. All of these ways are just ways of like one human consciousness trying to communicate the inner experience to another human consciousness. Text writing happens to be one way that we've stuck with for a long time, but I don't think in any way that has to be the final way. Right. Although one would argue that, that language is a, is a relatively fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, skill. And communication. One would argue. <laughs> one would argue. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 I think one of the, the issues with, uh, with, with, with images um, uh, is that um, it, it's actually a, it's a, it's a, a limited, a limited, audio, a limited uh, uh, creator set that can actually create genuinely interesting images. That's because Gen the interfaces aren't. I was just in a panel this morning that talked about uh, MRI machines that can basically, uh, at a distance, scan a person's brain and generate images dynamically on the fly in real time based on the thoughts that that person is having. I mean, imagine if you could just, through thinking, communicate your inner experience to me without having to bother with the, the trouble of words. Oh, oh, absolutely. I saw absolutely. Yeah, I like think that. that the future. <laughs> I think that, uh, um, um, and, and I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm a huge believer in a little bit beyond that, where, in fact, we are simply communicating with each other uh, through background thought. Um, Can this uh, do want to sit next but, to me and but, we hold hands? I feel like this is uh, <laughs> um, but, but there the is ending a, of the world. I know. There's, a, there's, a, there's a funny moment that people have when um, they'll look at a, they'll, they'll, I mean, today, They'll look at an image, they'll, um, uh, they'll have an experience, 
and it, it ends up getting communicated primarily through, mm -hmm. um, uh, through language, not, not, not so much text, but through language, through descriptions. Um, um, when you see, when you, if you see a chart or a graph and there's a piece of insight you, you get, and you turn to the person next to you to explain that insight, you usually don't draw that chart or graph first. You usually explain it first. Um, and I actually I think that there's, there are things we can do a thousand times beyond language. But I think it, it's a mistake to degrade language. Yeah, I, um, I, it usually is <laughs> one of the things that, is, uh, that people think of when they think of intelligence um, as a defining characteristic. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think uh, text is very universal, right? Like everybody uh, learns how to read and write. And I think that's not going away anytime soon. And I think what the internet has allowed authorship how it's really changed is that A, anybody can do it. There's no barriers to actually getting an audience. Anybody can put their work up. But not only that, you're able to get tremendous feedback uh, from an audience that will actually make you a better writer. At least on Wattpad, that is the single biggest uh, asset that we offer people is you're not writing in isolation with nobody there, nobody listening. It's the fact that you just have to post one chapter, and there's an audience, and that audience is encouraging, and they're giving you feedback, and you're able to get data, and you're able to see who's commenting on your work, and what, what parts work, and what resonates. So I think you know, this really changes the game of authorship in a massive way by giving access to people, and then really great feedback. No, that's and interesting, because usually on the internet, people don't leave you great feedback. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, you know, I mean, when I uploaded I my first great. song, I waited three months for the first comment. It was 1999. Yeah. There was no high-speed internet, yeah. and the first comment was after three months. Yeah. And you know, it took a lot of time to load that yeah. comment. I was really looking <laughs> forward to And no. it was, I didn't even have the, I didn't have time to download your song, but you have a silly last name. <laughs> great. And that was the first evil comment I got. <laughs> I think that's very true, and on Wattpad, we've really, why we've been able to grow our audience is because it's a really positive community where the writer, the author, actually has control of the comments in that you know, they can choose to uh, keep the comments on their page or take them off if that is the case, but the, the purpose of the community is to get people writing. It's right. not to review or critique stuff, which is very different in certain communities. And, and I would have to, I mean, given what I do, I mean, my notion of authorship is, uh, something that can be actually handed over to the machine. Uh, because, in fact, there is a world of, there is a world of symbols. Uh, there is a world of data. Uh, there are, there's a world of, of visualization, which is absolutely impenetrable to most people. Um, I mean, th in terms of books, I mean, forget about books for a moment. Who here has interacted with a spreadsheet in the last month? All right. Who enjoyed that experience? <laughs> no one. No. Two, Two people. people. <laughs> Two people. Good for you. God bless you. Um, Both uh, of you, get out of the, here. <laughs> the reality is, is that when people look at data, they struggle with it. They struggle with it. And now in the world of big data, they struggle with it massively. And as we are approaching uh, the, the next world, and that is the world of, of, the, um, of, quanti of quantified self, the world of the Internet of Things, more and more information, data about everything we touch will be there. But we can't get to it. And right now, we're beholden to a, a class of reasoners, uh, the data scientists, to take that data and interpret it for us. But we can't have data scientists in our living room uh, telling us about everything that's going on with our Nest uh, thermostat. Uh, we need something to tell us what's going on. And so for me, giving the machine the ability to look at this data, figure out what's going on in the world, and literally tell you, and not necessarily in a huge piece of text, but in, even in a, uh, a back and forth, a, a dialogue, but to tell you in English what's going on in the world means we can democratize this world of data. Yeah, but that's a very utopian rhetoric, and a lot of what data is capable of communicating is actually very superficial. And also, I mean, it's a lot very of the factual. It's not interesting is... necessarily. There won't be uh, death and sex I, in I think stories. it's superficial now because, in fact, all we get is you, you wear your Fitbit and you get a chart. Yeah. All right, but if your Fitbit is combined with uh, with, with medical information, story. with medical information, <laughs> de, uh, your, your dietary information. It's not utopian. I mean, the technology exists today. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that that's a very incomplete notion of a human existence, to just look at the numbers and say, like, the only things that matter are things that we can measure. I didn't say that. But I think that's what you're implying. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> because not I, at all. I think no, this no, speaks to the testimony of something like Wattpad, which has captured the imaginations of millions of people, not by using data, but by being a narrative imagination I think poetic that, I'm just saying that the numbers are part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, that having it be that the machine and analysts who are working with the machine know everything about what's going on in the world 
that is reflected in those numbers, and we can't get to it, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a sin. Uh, when the machine can actually communicate that information to us. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. We, did a, uh, we took a, a data set from ProPublica that was um, uh, data around uh, the uh, educational opportunities afforded by uh, high schools and uh, the economic conditions of those high schools. ProPublica was able to write one story, one story about a national level view of that. Uh, we were able to take that data and we wrote a story for every, and a comparative analysis story for every single high school in the country, which when you were at that high school and you checked with Foursquare, suddenly you had this story. And you had a description of what was going on, what were the opportunities in the school, and in fact the challenges that they had to, to confront um, because of their the, uh, the economic condition, and what other schools were doing in the, in the neighborhood, in the district, that were similar or different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the whole story of the school, but it's a tremendously important and impactful story of that school. Okay, I'm going to move us on. So, um, <laughs> A few years ago, I read this book by Nicholas Carr called The Shallows, and in it, he puts forth this idea that as we spend all this time online surfing and skimming over information, yes, we're reading, but we're not reading deeply. And because we're not reading deeply, we're losing the ability to have deep thought. He equates the ability to think deeply with the ability to read deeply. And so he suggests that our internet age, that the web is actually kind of dumbing us down, and it's contributing if I can summarize it, to the demise of Western civilization or, or civilization in general. Um, what do you guys think of this? Do you think that this, the digital age is, is contributing to an undermining of human intelligence or is it an enhancement? Are we going to be smarter? Again, I, ge I generally don't believe in like, things being good or things being bad. Like Things are complicated. And when you add a new technology to quote unquote solve a problem, you end up not solving the problem. You change the system in which the problem exists, mm -hmm. which may have the side effect of solving the problem, but also will introduce new problems. Every technology does this. And so you can say, has technology made our ability to think deeply uh, worse? Maybe, but it's also given us new abilities of, of types of thinking that we, mm -hmm. that we didn't have before, new right. modalities. So I think it just, it just changes things. Um, I mean, I will say, like, the, I, I have this image of human thought sometimes as like a little stone with a string tied around it that's being dragged along the surface of a lake. And the faster you drag the string, the more the stone stays on the surface and it eventually just starts skipping along. And then the slower you move and then finally stop your hand, the stone starts to sink deeper. And I think that's actually a really appropriate metaphor for how human thought and critical thinking works. You need to kind of slow down and concentrate. Well, I have another because I told you before, I have a, my dad is a real, real book lover. Yes, I know. We, we wanted to get him for the panel. <laughs> like, I, and I really love my dad. He's a good dad. And he, like, uh, you know, I grew up, he would, like, be subscribed to two libraries at the same time because one library wasn't enough, and he had a book on the way to work, a different book on the way back from work, a book while brushing his teeth, a book while cooking. And it's a different book, everyone. I just bought him an iPhone. There you know what he does? He takes photos of books and reads them on there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, exactly the yeah. thing we talked about. Yeah. But anyway, so don't tell him what I'm saying now because I'm now going to agree with him. When I argue with him, I don't agree with him. So, yeah, you don't know him. So, um, he always says that it's, it's like about the fact that he has the attention to read the whole book, sometimes really long books. And I really want to have that attention. But these days, I don't even have the attention to read an email with more than five lines. Right. I'm like, oh, he thinks I'm going to read that. Oh, come on. <laughs> and I actually, and I noticed it's obviously not just me. I have this like, uh, uh, website, a blog that I read that goes and takes like, the most interesting articles. And I saw, and it's supposed to be really good and things. And I noticed they, they don't just make you scroll down. They tell you how much time it's going to take you to read that thing. Right. And I noticed myself, oh my god, more than three minutes? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think you are taking more than three minutes of my time? And it's really romantically sad because first of all, when I do like, you know, spank myself or however you say that, not spank myself, how do you say that? <laughs> that's, that's something else you might do. I do that, but that's Discipl separate. Yeah. Discipline yourself. Yeah, discipline myself. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You guys really yeah. need to get together this love letter video. <laughs> English is not my first language. Um, I sometimes really get, you know, I can read something that would really be interesting, will really, you know, make me aroused and interested in that article. And like something like that could really... Maybe you did mean spank. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But Charles, you 
podcast. Okay. You just stop uh, talking. I, think. I, I can't believe how quickly this has gone. But we actually Trying to spice have, up the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> doing great. We have 10 minutes left. Okay. So I feel like I need to open this up for questions because we really want you to be part of this conversation. Um, so there are gentlemen, I think, with, or people with microphones. And if anyone has a question, let's raise your hand. The mic will come and then ask it. Hi, thank you all. Very uh, exciting, animated conversation up there. Um, my question is about our ability to use technology or interact with technology in a way that doesn't detract from us having an experience in, in the physical world. And I know the digital era is all about, um, what is it like, cyberspace and you know, falling in love with your phone and your phone can have emotions and I mean, I'm kind of being a bit dramatic, but mm -hmm. no. some people see that as a vision of the future that they want to exist in. And when I hear about that, I actually find it terrifying and I'd rather not live that way and I wouldn't want my kids to experience that. I live here mm -hmm. and I hike and I bike and I ski. And so I, I chose to exist in a place like this to interact with the physical world as opposed to a city where it's more about social constructs and, and living in the built environment. And I want to understand how you all see um, mm -hmm. addressing that tension between technology and the physical world. Great question. Thank you. Um, awesome. So you all heard it. I have a whole riff on this, but I'm happy to let somebody else go first. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, it's a, yeah, go ahead, uh, please. So I speak too much. I, I think <laughs> you bring up a really great point, right? It can't, and, and it's to your point as well, it's like it's not all or nothing, right? It's like there, I would say what the internet actually gives a lot of people is personal connection. Like it's not about just interacting with a piece of content that is very transactional. That's what actually a book is. It's like you're sitting there and you're not able to connect with real people about what you're reading or about your thoughts or your feelings or have personal connection. And I can say from like real you know, experiences that our readers and writers have had that they are far less lonely because it's not about the book format, it's about the personal connection through stories. And a lot of these people don't find that in their physical world. They, they, they need to have the ability to be connected with other people virtually. But that doesn't replace this idea of having connections with the physical world. Like if we're all walking around on our phones all the time, like we are missing out on this amazing world. Uh, so it's, I, I think yeah, it's a bit about both and, and sort of figuring out how to have both of those things in your life. Yeah, I, th I would say like I think technology is probably the most powerful tool humans have ever created. And most tools we've created don't impose themselves on us. You know, you need a hammer, you use it, and then you put it down. You need a leaf blower, you use it, and then you put it away, and you go back to your life. Technology does not operate this way. It asks more and more of us. And this is compounded by the fact mm -hmm. that a lot of the people who design the technologies we use have it in their interest for us to get very hooked on those things because they can turn our attention into money. Um, so I think it's actually incumbent upon all of us as individuals to be very aware of the value of our attention and how we're spending it and the fact that technologies can be very addictive but also that they're very powerful and useful and to moderate for ourselves and for our kids and for our families and for our friends the amount of time we're actually using these things which can be both tremendously beautiful but also very destructive like anything that's complex. Yeah, but I think that's already true. We are aware, and I mean, I'm guessing at the, on, in the 50s where televisions became something, I'm sure if there was a conference like, like that in the 50s, someone would stand up and say, I don't want to grow up in a world where the kids are watching TV all the time. We did. <laughs> <laughs> we survived. Yeah. I mean, we don't speak the most amazing English, but we're pretty good. <laughs> and I was, look, I was also, I'm telling you also on, on just on hope to the future. I was a kid and I grew up in like the, the mostly early 90s, late 80s, like my, and I was into the computer all the time and I wouldn't go out and like my mom would say, go out and play with the kids. And she just found a drawing where I drew my whole family and me with the back to the drawing on the computer. <laughs> so I'm like the nightmare of every parent. And now I love hiking and running and things like that and <laughs> that I didn't have so much as a kid. Like I, I think it's like a birth of a new world and it's right away there's fear, you know, there's like this is not what I've been growing up with and this is not what, and I don't want this. Obviously, if, you, if it's going to take your whole life, it's dangerous, but that's true. Also, if you now take a blow or whatever you said and just use it all the time, that's like a crazy person. Okay. 
Anything that's too much, bad example. Anything that's too much will be obviously bad. So trying to balance those things, but not being too fearful of the, the whole. Uh, Let's go to experience. another question. Um, how about this lady here in the front? Oh, sorry, sorry, we have a mic over there already, sorry. Hi, thanks so much for the stimulating conversation. I'm really um, uh, provoked by your whole framing of this as, you know, based, uh, using all this technology for personal expression, but it also occurs to me that there are two other types of applications, and I'm curious to have any one of your points of view, perhaps Jonathan, in particular you, but others, on um, the use of some of the applications that you've developed for, for, commercialization, you know, for commercial applications, but even more, perhaps a little scarier, or maybe more useful, uh, for intelligence uh, collection and, and dissemination and uh, visualization of information. I'm just curious if you've thought beyond the realm of personal expression, which is most of what I think we've talked about here today. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be, would you be best to speak about sure. that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, this is, um, I mean, the, the technology that I, that I, that I come from um, is really all about, it's less about personal expression and more about uh, finding various ways in which we can uh, let people see the world. Uh, now, it's, it's, uh, it has a, the difference between sort of what I do and I think a lot of what, uh, what else the other uh, people on the panel do is that for us, uh, it's, it's literally trying to be as much as possible truth preserving. That is looking at the data, looking at the analysis, looking at the stories that are told from the point of view of given that this is the world as reflected in the data that we have in front of us, um, here is what we believe to be happening. Uh, and that can be used in a lot of places, not, not in data gathering. We actually not, are not in the data gathering business, but in, uh, in giving voice to the world um, and actually making it easier for people to interact with um, some of the truths in the world without having to interact with the data directly. And so for us, it's really trying to make people in many ways smarter uh, because they don't have to have data analytic skills uh, they don't have to understand exactly what's going on in the data in order to see what's happening in the world, so again, through the lens of that data, through the lens of the analysis uh, that, that pulls truth out of that data. Um, that can be used for good and for evil. Um, uh, there's no way around it. Um, uh, but the, uh, the notion here uh, is that um, there is a world of data that is denied uh, to us, uh, that for most people, they do not understand much of what's happening in the world from the level of uh, climate change to um, uh, the gun control. And we can surface that, uh, that information and turn it into something that's real, uh, that's personal and focused without having them deal with the data directly. OK, let's have one more question. Thank you. I'm trying to be good natured about the fact that you have completely obsoleted what I used to do for a living, <laughs> uh, which was run a, a large advertising agency. So we knew how to staff Ogilvy when we were putting our house together. And I want to ask you a slightly different question. What sorts of talents, affinities, and skills do you want to surround yourself with these days? These guys. Well, we've got to get a little further and deeper. Who okay. else is out there? I, w one thing that I think is really interesting in that, and, I, and we haven't really talked as much as we should, but the ability to be able to bring the science and the humanities together. Mm -hmm. But frankly, that's what you see as the, the tension in the dialogue happening on stage. So it's people who understand the computer science, the ability to program um, with the people who understand what is evocative to humans, you know, how to tell stories. Uh, so. Personally, I think it's, it's about getting those two groups together in a really collaborative way. I think that was the genius of Steve yeah. Jobs. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. well, genius of some like, of... Especially if you, I mean, the tech stuff is always cast in terms of tech, but if you think about it as a language, mm -hmm. then it belongs in the humanities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the technical part is really trivial. That's like yeah. learning how to write cursive script in handwriting. But then once you've learned a language, the much bigger and much more challenging question is what will you use the language to say? Yeah, they call uh, it a programming yeah. language yeah. for a reason. That's right. It is, a, it is literally a language. And so this is a question that people, very few people actually ask, even among the genius whiz programmer people that a lot of us know, like many of them don't think of themselves as 
certainly not as poets or yeah. as writers or as people who even have an opinion about stuff that they can express through their work. They think of themselves mainly as technicians, tinkerers, experimenters, this type of thing, which are all valuable roles, but I think there is a place beyond the tinkering when we start to actually formulate statements with these languages that are useful to the world. But I think this is what, what's beautiful, and that will be the answer, I'll tell you, because he, I saw him also yesterday, and I was together with the audience, just like now, was really astonished by that <laughs> thing with the data, with the yeah. feeling thing. And the reason is that usually a developer would go and maybe like in your head would join Google or Dell or whatever and will do something boring. Here, like what happens now, sorry, is there, are they sponsors or something? <laughs> I don't think you've named anyone specifically. <laughs> anyway, okay. now what happens is that suddenly there's like people that I feel like the friends I grew up with who are learning uh, some kind of programming language because their parents bought them a Commodore, mm -hmm. a computer, and things like that. But they, 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 if they wouldn't have had that, like if I would have, haven't had the Commodore, I would probably just have a rock band and I would like more do weed and stuff. Right <laughs> now here what you see is someone that knew that language, that speaks that programming language, but is an artist. So he wants to see something, create an art mm -hmm. that like, uh, like an artistic person would think about, and he creates an art form that didn't exist before. Yeah. And that's what I think is so, so greatly beautiful about it because then you really open up what's the canvas of creation. And at, at least in Interlude, in my company, and I think in a lot of like startups and things like that, you look for those people. And it's a very difficult thing to find because usually those people are just like artists are very self-centered in a good way. <laughs> and like they want to do their own self -sufficient thing. Self-sufficient is the word. Self-sufficient. I understood politically correct in a lot of things today. Thank you. So I think that's all we have time for okay. so sadly. Thank you. I, I want to thank the Aspen Ideas Festival for inviting us. I'd like to thank our panel for participating, and I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Thanks so much.